And we left off with chapter 34 of Queen of Shadows. <clears throat> Aelin knew she had things to do. Vital things. Terrible things. But she could sacrifice one day. Keeping to the shadows whenever possible, she spent the afternoon showing Rowan the city, from the elegant residential districts to the markets crammed with vendors selling goods for the summer solstice in two weeks. There was no sign or scent of Lorcan, thank the gods. But the king's men were posted at a few busy intersections, giving Aelin an opportunity to point them out to Rowan. He studied them with trained efficiency, his keen sense of smell enabling him to pick out which ones were still human and which were inhabited by lesser Volg demons. From the look on his face, she honestly felt a little bad for any guard that came across him, demon or human. A little, but not much. Especially given that their presence alone somewhat ruined her plans for a peaceful, quiet day. She wanted to show Rowan the good parts of the city before dragging him into its underbelly. So she took him to one of Nesrin's family's bakeries, where she went so far as to buy a few of those pear tarts. At the docks, Rowan even convinced her to try some pan-fried trout. She'd once sworn never to eat fish and had cringed as the fork had neared her mouth. But the damned thing was delicious. She ate her entire fish, then snuck bites of Rowan's to his snarling dismay. Here. Rowan was here with her, in Rifthold, and there was so much more she wanted him to see, to learn about what her life had been like. She never wanted to share any of it before. Even when she'd heard the crack of a whip after lunch, as they cooled themselves by the water, she'd wanted him to, with her to witness it. He'd silently stood with a hand on her shoulder as they watched the cluster of chained slaves hauling cargo onto one of the ships. Watched, and could do nothing. Soon, she promised herself. Putting an end to that was a high priority. They meandered back through the market stalls, one after another, until the smell of roses and lilies wafted by, the river breeze sweeping petals of every shape and color past their feet as the flower girls shouted about their wares. She turned to him. If you were a gentleman, you would buy me. Rowan's face had gone blank. His eyes hollow as he stared at one of the flower girls in the center of the square, a basket of hothouse peonies on her thin arm. Young, pretty, dark-haired, and, oh gods, she shouldn't have brought him here. Lyria had sold flowers in the market. She'd been a poor flower girl before Prince Rowan had spotted her and instantly known she was his mate. A fairy tale, until she'd been slaughtered by enemy forces, pregnant with Rowan's child. Aelin clenched and unclenched her fingers, any words lodged in her throat. Rowan was still staring at the girl, who smiled at a passing woman, a glow with some inner light. I didn't deserve her, Rowan said quietly. Aelin swallowed hard. There were wounds in both of them that had yet to heal, but this one... Truth. As always, she could offer him one truth in exchange for another. I didn't deserve Sam. He looked at her at last. She'd do anything to get rid of the agony in his eyes. Anything. His gloved fingers brushed her own, then dropped back to his side. She clenched her hand into a fist again. Come, I want to show you something. Aelin scrounged up some dessert from where the street vendor from the street vendors, while Rowan waited in a shadowed alley. Now, sitting on one of the wooden rafters in the gilded dumb of the darkened royal theater, Aelin munched on a lemon cookie and swung her legs in the open air below. The space was the same as she remembered it, but the silence, the darkness. These used to be my favorite place in the entire world, she said, her words too loud in the emptiness. Sunlight poured in from the roof door they'd broken into illuminating the rafters in the golden dome, gleaming faintly off the polished brass banisters and the blood-red curtains of the stage below. Arabin owns a private box, so I went any chance I could. The nights I didn't feel like dressing up or being seen, or maybe the nights I had a job and only an hour free, I'd creep in here through that door and listen. Rowan finished his cookie and gazed at the dark space below. He'd been so quiet for the past thirty minutes, as if he'd pulled back into a place where she couldn't reach him. She nearly sighed with relief as he said, I've never seen an orchestra, or a theater like this, crafted around sound and luxury. 
Even in Doranel, the theaters and amphitheaters are ancient, with benches or just steps. There's no place like this anywhere, perhaps, even in Terrasen. Then you'll have to build one. With what money? You think people are going to be happy to starve while I build a theater for my own pleasure? Perhaps not right away, but if you believe one would benefit the city, the country, then do it. Artists are essential. Florine had said as much. Aelin sighed. This place has been shut down for months, and yet I swear I can still hear the music floating in the air. Rowan angled his head, studying the dark with those immortal senses. Perhaps the music does live on, in some form. Fancy, get out of the bag. You're being awfully loud, kitty cat. Sorry about that. The thought made her eyes sting. I wish you could have heard it. I wish you could have been there to hear Pitor conduct the Stygian sweep. Sometimes I feel like I'm still sitting down in that box, 13 years old and weeping from the sheer glory of it. You cried? She could almost see the memories of their training this spring flash in his eyes. All those times music had calmed or unleashed her magic. It was a part of her soul, as much as he was. The final movement, every damn time. I would go back to the keep and have the music in my mind for days, even as I trained or killed or slept. It was a kind of madness, loving that music. It was why I started playing the piano forte, so I could come home at night and make my poor attempt at replicating it. She never told anyone that, never taken anyone here either, Rowan said. Is there a pianoforte in here? I haven't played in months and months, and this is a horrible idea for about a dozen different reasons, she said for the tenth time as she finished rolling back the curtains on the stage. She'd stood here before, when Arabin's patronage had earned them invitations to galas held on the stage for the sheer thrill of walking on the sacred space. But now... Amid the gloom of the dead theater, lit with a single candle Rowan had found, it felt like standing in a tomb. The chairs of the orchestra were still arranged as they probably had been the night the musicians had walked out to protest the massacres in Indovier and Calicella. They were all still unaccounted for, and considering the array of miseries the king now heaped upon the world, death would have been the kindest option. Clenching her jaw, Aelin leashed the familiar, writhing anger. Rowan was standing beside the pianoforte near the front right of the stage, running a hand over the smooth surface as if it were a prize horse. She hesitated before the magnificent instrument. It seems like sacrilege to play that thing, she said, the word echoing loudly in the space. Since when are you the religious type anyway? Rowan gave her a crooked smile. Where should I stand to best hear it? You might be in for a lot of pain at first. Self-conscious today, too? If Lorcan's snooping about, she grumbled, I'd rather n he not report back to Maeve that I'm lousy at playing. She pointed to a spot on the stage. There, stand there and stop talking, you insufferable bastard. He chuckled and moved to the spot she'd indicated. She swallowed as she slid onto the smooth bench and folded back the lid, revealing the gleaming white and black keys beneath. She positioned her feet on the pedals, but made no move to touch the keyboard. I haven't played since before Nehemia died, she admitted, the words too heavy. We can come back another day if you want. A gentle, steady offer. His silver hair gleamed in the dim candlelight. There might not be another day, and, and I would consider my life very sad indeed if I never played again. He nodded and crossed his arms. A silent order. She faced the keys and slowly set her hands on the ivory. It was smooth and cool and waiting, a great beast of sound and joy about to be awakened. I need to warm up, she blurted, and plunged in without another word, playing as softly as she could. Once she had started seeing the notes in her mind again, when muscle memory had her fingers reaching for those familiar chords, she began. It was not the sorrowful, lovely piece she had once played for Dorian, and it was not the light, dancing melodies she'd played for sport. It was not the complex and clever pieces she had played for Nehemia and Kale. This piece was a celebration, a reaffirmation of life, of glory, of the pain and beauty in breathing. Perhaps that was why she'd gone to hear it performed every year, after so much killing and torture and punishment, as a reminder of what she was, of what she struggled to keep. 
Up and up it built, the sound breaking from the pianoforte like the heart song of a god, until Rowan drifted over to stand beside the instrument, until she whispered to him, Now and the crescendo shattered into the world, note after note after note. The music crashed around them, roaring through the emptiness of the theater. The hollow silence that had been inside her for so many months now overflowed with sound. She brought the piece home to its final explosive triumphant chord. When she looked up, panting slightly, Rowan's eyes were lined with silver, his throat bobbing. Somehow, after all this time, her warrior prince still managed to surprise her. He seemed to struggle for words, but he finally breathed. Show me. Show me how you did that. So she obliged him. They spent the better part of an hour seated together on the bench, Aelin teaching him the basics of the pianoforte, explaining the sharps and the flats, the pedals, the notes and chords. When Rowan heard someone at last coming to investigate the music, they slipped out. She stopped at the Royal Bank, warning Rowan to wait in the shadows across the street, as she again sat in the master's office while one of his underlings rushed in and out of, on her business. She eventually left with another bag of gold, vital now that there was one more mouth to feed and body to clothe, and found Rowan exactly where she'd left him, pissed off that she'd refused to let him accompany her. But he'd raised too many questions. So you're using your own money to support us? Rowan asked as they slipped down a side street. A flock of beautifully dressed young women passed by on the sunny avenue beyond the alley and gaped at the hooded, powerfully built male who stormed past, and then all turned to admire the view from behind. Aelin flashed her teeth at them. For now, she said to him. And what will you do for money later? She glanced sidelong at him. It'll be taken care of. By whom? Me. Explain. You'll find out soon enough. She gave him a little smile that she knew drove him insane. Rowan made to grab her by the shoulder, but she ducked away from his touch. Uh-uh, better not move too swiftly or someone might notice. He snarled, the sound definitely not human, and she chuckled. Annoyance was better than guilt and grief. Just be patient and don't get your feathers ruffled. And that was chapter 34. But yes, they are definitely so soft and respectful of each other. I love them so much. Oh, I forgot. Oops, I hit my desk. Quit moving monitor. I forgot to get my notebook out to write my timestamps. One moment. We are. There we go. And on to chapter 35. Gods, he hated the smell of their blood. But damn if it wasn't a glorious thing to be covered in when two dozen bog lay dead around him and good people were finally safe. Drenched in bog blood from head to toe, Kale Westfall searched for a clean bit of fabric with which to wipe his own, his black stained blade, but came up empty. Across the hidden clearing, Nestrin was doing the same. He'd killed four, she'd taken down seven. Kale knew only because he'd been watching her the entire time. She'd paired off with someone else during the ambush. He'd apologized for snapping at her the other night, but she just nodded and still teamed up with another rebel. But now? She gave up trying to wipe down her own blade and looked toward him. Her midnight eyes were bright, and even with the, her fire, her face splattered in black blood. Her smile, relieved, a bit of wild with the thrill of the fight. Their victory was beautiful. The word clanged through him. Kale frowned, and the expression was instantly wiped from her face. His mind was always a jumble after a fight, as if it had been spun around and around and twisted upside down, and then given a heavy dose of liquor. But he strode toward her. They'd done this. Together, they'd saved these people. More at once than they'd ever rescued before, and with no loss of life beyond the vault. 
Gore and blood were splattered on the grassy forest floor, the only remnants of the decapitated bog bodies that had already been hauled away and dumped behind a boulder. When they left, they'd pay the body's former owners the tribute of burning them. Three of his group had set to unchaining the huddled prisoners now seated in the grass. The bog bastard had stuffed so many of them into the two wagons that Kale had nearly gagged at the smell. Each wagon had only a small, barred window high up on the wall, and a man had fainted inside. But all of them were safe now. He wouldn't stop until the others still hidden in the city were out of harm's way as well. A woman reached up with her filthy hands, her nails split and fingertips swollen as if she tried to claw her way out of whatever hellhole she'd been kept in. Thank you, she whispered, her voice hoarse, probably from screaming that had gone unanswered. unanswered. Kale's throat tightened as he gave the woman's hands a gentle squeeze, mindful of her near-broken fingers, and stepped to where Nesrin was now wiping her blade on the grass. You fought well, he told her. I know I did. Nesrin looked over her shoulder at him. We need to get them off the river. Boats won't wait forever. Fine. He didn't expect warmth or camaraderie after a battle, despite that smile, but... Maybe once we're back in Rifthold, we can go for a drink. He needed one. Badly. Nesrin rose from her crouch, and he fought the urge to wipe a splatter of black blood from her tan cheek. The hair she tied back had come loose, and the warm forest breeze set the strands floating past her face. I thought we were friends, she said. We are friends, he said carefully. Friends don't spend time with each other only when they're feeling sorry for themselves, or bite each other's heads off for asking difficult questions. I told you I was sorry for snapping the other night. She sheathed her blade. I'm fine with distracting each other for whatever reasons, Kale, but at least be honest about it. She op He opened his mouth to object, but maybe she was right. I do like your company, he said. I wanted to go for a drink to celebrate, not brood, and I'd like to go with you. She pursed her lips. That was the most half-assed attempt at flattery I've ever heard. But fine, I'll join you. The worst part was that she didn't even sound mad. She genuinely meant it. He could go drinking with or without her, and she wouldn't particularly care. The thought didn't sit well. Personal conversation decidedly over, Nesrin surveyed the clearing, the wagon, and the carnage. Why now? The king has had ten years to do this. Why the sudden rush to get these people all down to Morath? What's it building to? Some of the rebels turned their way. Kale studied the bloody aftermath as if it were a map. Aelin Galathinius's return might have started it, Kale said, aware of those who listened. No, Nesrin said simply. Aelin announced herself barely two months ago. Something this large? It's been in the works for a long, long time. Sen, one of the leaders with whom Kale met regularly, said, We should consider yielding the city, move to other places where their foothold isn't as secure. Maybe try to establish a border somehow. If Aelin Galathinius is lingering near Rifthold, we should meet with her. Maybe head for Terrison, push Adderlin out, and hold the line. We can't abandon Rifthold, Kael said, glancing at the prisoners being helped to their feet. It might be suicide to stay, Sen challenged. Some of the others nodded their agreement. Kael opened his mouth, but Nesrin said, We need to head for the river. Fast. He gave her a grateful look, but she was already moving. Aelin waited until everyone was asleep and the full moon had arisen before climbing out of bed, careful not to jostle Rowan. She slipped into the closet and dressed swiftly, strapping on the weapons she'd casually dumped there that afternoon. Neither male had commented when she'd plucked Amaris from the dining table, claiming she wanted to clean it. She strapped the ancient blade onto her back, along with Goldrin, the two hilts peeking over either shoulder as she stood in front of the closet mirror and hastily braided back her hair. It was short enough now that braiding had become a nuisance, and the front bit slipped out, but at least it wasn't in her face. She cre crept from the closet, a spare cloak in hand, past the bed where Rowan's tattooed torso gleamed in the light of the full moon, leaking in from the window. He didn't stir as she snuck from the bedroom and out of the apartment, no more than a shadow. And that was chapter 35. Kale in the book also scares me too, I'm not gonna lie. 
I'm not gonna lie, he's a little scary. Also, I need to text my roommate real quick. And could you let avocado out if you get a pausing point in cooking dinner? Thanks. If not, let me know. Look, I just noticed my dog is pacing and I just fed her dinner, so she might have to go potty. <clears throat> okay, and I'm just going to adjust music just a touch. It's so hard to adjust music because I only have so many, so much volume control, you know. There we go. That works. Okay. And we are going to move on to chapter 36. Whew. It didn't take long for Aelin to set her trap. She could feel the eyes monitoring her as she found the patrol led by one of the more sadistic Vogue commanders. Thanks to Kale and Nesrin's reports, she knew their hideouts. What Kale and Nesrin didn't know what she had spent these nights sneaking out to track on her own was which sewer entrances the commanders used when going to speak to one of the word hounds. They seemed to prefer the most ancient waterways to swimming through the filth of the more recent main tunnels. She'd been getting as close as she dared, which usually was not near enough to overhear anything. Tonight, she slipped down into the sewers after the commander, her steps nearly silent on the slick stones. Trying to stifle her nausea at the stench, she'd waited until Kale, Nesrin, and their top lieutenants were out of the city, chasing down those prison wagons. If only so no one would get in her way again. She couldn't risk it. And as she walked, keeping far enough behind the Vol commander that he wouldn't hear, she began speaking softly. I got the key, she said, a sigh of relief passing over her lips. Twisting her voice just as Lysandra had showed her, she replied in a male tenor, You brought it with you? Of course I did. Now show me where you wanted to hide it. Patience, she said, trying not to smile too much as she turned down a corner, creeping along. It's just up this way. On she went, offering whispers of conversation, until she neared the crossroads where the Vol commanders liked to meet with their word hound overseer and fell silent. There, she dumped the spare cloak she'd brought, and then backtracked to a ladder leading up to the street. Aelin's breath caught as she pushed against the grate, and it mercifully gave. She heaved herself onto the street, her hands unsteady. For a moment, she contemplated lying there on the filthy, wet cobblestones, savoring the free air around her. But he was too close, so she silently sealed the grate again. It only took a minute before near-silent boots scraped on stone below, and a figure moved past the ladder, heading to where she'd left the cape, tracking her as he'd done all night. As she'd let him do all night. And when Lorcan walked right into that den of Vogue commanders, and the word hound that had come to retrieve their reports, when the clash of weapons and roar of dying filled her ears, Aelin merely sauntered down the street, whistling to herself. Aelin was striding down an alley three blocks from the warehouse when a force akin to a stone wall slammed her face first into the side of a brick building. You little bitch! Lorcan snarled in her ear. Both of her arms were somehow already pinned behind her back, his legs digging hard enough into hers that she couldn't move them. Hello, Lorcan, she said sweetly, turning her throbbing face as much as she could. From the corner of her eye, she could make out cruel features beneath his dark hood along with onyx eyes and matching shoulder-length hair. And, damn, elongated canines shone far too near her throat. One hand gripped her arms like a steel vice. 
Lorcan used the other to push her head against the damp brick so hard her cheek scraped. You think that was funny? It was worth a shot, wasn't it? He reeked of blood, that awful, otherworldly, vulg blood. He pushed her face a little harder into the wall, his body an immovable force against her. I'm going to kill you. Ah, uh, about that she said, and shifted her wrist just enough for him to feel the blade she flicked free in the moment before she'd sensed his attack, the steel now resting against his groin. Immortality seems like a long, long time to go without your favorite body part. I'll rip out your throat before you can move. She pressed the blade harder against him. Big risk to take, isn't it? For a moment, Lork had remained unmoving, still shoving her into the wall with the force of five centuries of lethal training. Then, cool air nipped at her neck, her back. By the time she whirled, Lorcan was several paces away. In the darkness, she could barely make out the granite-hewn features, but she remembered enough from that day in Doranel to guess that beneath his hood, the unforgiving face was livid. Honestly, she said, leaning against the wall, I'm a little surprised you fell for it. You must think I'm truly stupid. Where's Rowan? He sneered, his close-fitting dark clothes, armored with black metal at the forearms and shoulders, seemed to gobble up the dim light. Still warming your bed? She didn't want to know how Lorcan knew that. Isn't that all you pretty males are good for? She looked him up and down, marking the many weapons both visible and concealed. Massive, as massive as Rowan and Adian, and utterly unimpressed by her. Did you kill all of them? There were only three by my count. There were six of them, and one of those stone demons, you bitch, and you knew it. So he had found a way to kill one of the word hounds. Interesting. And good. You know, I'm really rather tired of being called that. You'd think five centuries would give you enough time to come up with something more creative. Come a little closer, and I'll show you just what five centuries can do. Why don't I show you what happens when you whip my friends, you spineless prick? Violence danced across those brutal features. Such a big mouth for someone who, without her fire tricks. Such a big mouth for someone who needs to mind his surroundings. Rowan's knife was angled along Lorcan's throat before he could so much as blink. She'd been wondering how long it would take him to find her. He'd probably awaken the moment she pushed back the covers. Start talking, Rowan ordered Lorcan. Lorcan gripped his sword, a mighty, beautiful weapon that she had no doubt had ended many lives on killing fields in distant lands. You don't want to get into this fight right now. Give me a good reason not to spill your blood, Rowan said. If I die, Maeve will offer aid to the King of Otterland against you. Bullshit! Aelin spat. Friends close, but enemies closer, right? Lorcan said. Slowly, Rowan let go of him and stepped away. All three of them monitored every movement the others made, until Rowan was at Aelin's side, his teeth bared at Lorcan. The aggression pouring off the Fey Prince was enough to make her jumpy. You made a fatal mistake, Lorcan said to her. The moment you showed my queen that vision of you with a key, he flicked his black eyes to Rowan. And you, you stupid fool, allying yourself Binding yourself to a mortal queen? What will you do, Rowan, when she grows old and dies? What about when she looks old enough to be her mother? Will you still share her bed? Still- That's enough, Rowan said softly. She didn't let one flicker of the emotions that shot through her show. Didn't dare to even think about them for fear Lorcan could smell them. Lorcan just laughed. You think you beat Maeve? She allowed you to walk out of Doranel. Both of you. Aelin yawned. Honestly, Rowan, I don't know how you put up with him for so many centuries. Five minutes and I'm bored to tears. Watch yourself, girl, Lorcan said. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not in a week, but someday you will trip up, and I'll be waiting. Really, you fey males and your dramatic speeches. She turned to walk away, a move she could only make because of the prince standing between them. But she looked back over her shoulder, dropping all pretense of amusement, of boredom. Let that killing calm rise close enough to the surface that she knew there was nothing human in her eyes as she said to Lorcan. I will never forget, not for one moment, what you did to him that day in Doranel. 
Your miserable existence is at the bottom of my priority, priority list. But one day, Lorcan, she smiled a little. One day, I'll come to claim that debt too. Consider tonight a warning. Aelin had just unlocked the warehouse door when Rowan's deep voice purred from behind. Busy night, princess? She hauled open the door, and the two of them slipped into the near-black warehouse, illuminated only by a lantern near the back stairs. She took her time locking the sliding door behind her. Busy, but enjoyable. You're going to have to try a lot harder to sneak past me, Rowan said, the words laced with a growl. You and Adian are insufferable. Thank the gods Lurkin hadn't seen Adian, hadn't scented his heritage. I was perfectly safe. Lie. She hadn't been sure whether Lorcan would even show up, or whether he would fall for her little trap. Rowan poked her cheek gently, and pain rippled. You're lucky scraping you is all he did. Next time you sneak out to pick a fight with Lorcan, you will tell me beforehand. I will do no such thing. It's my damn business, and it's not just your business. Not anymore. You will take me along with you next time. The next time I sneak out, she seethed. If I catch you following me like some overprotective nursemaid, I will- You'll what? He stepped up close enough to share breath with her, his fangs flashing. In the light of the lanterns, she could clearly see his eyes. And he could see hers as she silently said, I don't know what I'll do, you bastard, but I'll make your life a living hell for it. He snarled, and the sound stroked down her skin as she read the unspoken words in his eyes. Stop being stubborn. Is this some attempt at keeping to cling to your pendant independence? And so what if it is? She shot back. Just let me do these things on my own. I can't promise that, he said, the dim light caressing his tan skin, the elegant tattoo. She punched him in the bicep, hurting herself more than him. Just because you're older and stronger doesn't mean you're entitled to order me around. It's exactly because of those things that I can do whatever I please. She let out a high-pitched sound and went to pinch his side, and he grabbed her hand, squeezing it tightly, dragging her a step closer to him. She tilted her head back to look at him. For a moment, alone in that warehouse with nothing but the crates keeping them company, she allowed herself to take in his face, those green eyes, the strong jaw, immortal, unyielding, blooded with power. Brute. Brat. She loosed a breathy laugh. Did you really lure Lurkin- Lork- Did you really lure Lorkin into a sewer with one of those creatures? It was such an easy trap that I'm actually disappointed he fell for it. Rowan chuckled. You never stop surprising me. He hurt you. I'm never going to forgive that. Plenty of people have hurt me. If you're going to go after everyone, you'll have a busy life ahead of you. She didn't smile. What he said about me getting old? Don't. Just don't start with that. Go to sleep. What about you? He studied the warehouse door. I wouldn't put it past Lorcan to return the favor you dealt him tonight. He forgets and forgives even less easily than you do, especially when someone threatens to cut off his manhood. At least I said it would be a big mistake, she said with a fiendish grin. I was tempted to say little. Rowan laughed, his eyes dancing. Then you definitely would have been dead. And that was chapter 36. She is such a queen. I love her so much. I can smell dinner cooking and it smells... So, so delicious. On to chapter 37. This is a short one. There were men screaming in the dungeons. He knew because the demon had forced him to take a walk there, past every cell and rack. He thought he might know some of the prisoners, but he couldn't remember their names. He could never remember their names when the man on the throne ordered the demon to watch their interrogation. The demon was happy to oblige. Day after day after day. The king never asked them any questions. Some of the men cried, some screamed, and some stayed silent. Defiant, even. Yesterday, one of them, young, 
handsome, familiar, had recognized him and begged. He'd begged for mercy, insisted he knew nothing, and wept. But there was nothing he could do, even as he watched them suffer, even as the chambers filled with the reek of burning flesh and the coppery tang of blood. The demon savored it. Growing stronger each day, it went down there and breathed in their pain. He added their suffering to the memories that kept him company and let the demon take him back to those dungeons of agony and despair the next day and the next. On to chapter 38. Aelin didn't dare to go back to the sewers, not until she was certain Lorcan was out of the area and the bog weren't lurking about. The next night, they were all eating a dinner Aidian had scraped together from whatever was lying around the kitchen when the front door opened and Lysandra breezed in with a chirped hello that had them all releasing the weapons they'd grabbed. How do you do that? Adian demanded as she paraded into the kitchen. What a miserable looking meal, was all Lysandra said, peering over Adian's shoulder at the spread of bread, pickled vegetables, cold eggs, fruit, dried meat, and leftover breakfast pastries. Can't any of you cook? Aelin, who'd been swiping grapes off Rowan's plate, snorted. Breakfast, it seems, is the only meal any of us are decent at, and this one... She jabbed the thumb in Rowan's direction. Only knows how to cook meat on a stick over a fire. Lysandra nudged Aelin down the bench and squeezed onto the end. Her blue dress like liquid silk as she reached for some bread. Pathetic, utterly pathetic for such esteemed and mighty leaders. Adian braced his arms on the table. Make yourself at home, why don't you? Lysandra kissed the air between them. Hello, General. Good to see you're looking well. Aelin would have been content to sit back and watch, until Lysandra turned those up-tilted green eyes toward Rowan. I don't think we were introduced the other day. Her queenliness had something rather urgent to tell me. A sly cat's glance in Aelin's direction. Rowan, seated on Aelin's right, cocked his head to the side. Do you need an introduction? Lysandra's smile grew. I like your fangs, she said sweetly. Aelin choked on her grape. Of course Lysandra did. Rowan gave a little grin that usually sent Aelin running. Are you studying them so you can replicate them when you take my form, shapeshifter? Aelin's fork froze in midair. Bullshit, Adian said. All the amusement had vanished from the courtesan's face. Shapeshifter? Holy gods, what was fire magic or wind and ice compared to shapeshifting? Shifters. Spies and thieves and assassins, able to demand any price for their services. The bane of courts across the world, so feared that they'd been hunted nearly to extinction even before Adderlin had banned magic. Lysandra picked up a grape, examined it, and then flicked her eyes to Rowan. Perhaps I'm just studying you to know where to sink my fangs if I ever get my gifts back. Rowan laughed. It explains so much. You and I are nothing but beasts wearing human skins. Lysandra turned her attention to Aelin. No one knows this, not even Arabin. Her face was hard. A challenge and a question lay in those eyes. Secrets. Nahimi had kept secrets from her, too. Aelin didn't say anything. Lysandra's mouth tightened as she turned to Rowan. How'd you know? A shrug, even as Aelin felt his attention on her and knew he could read the emotions biting at her. I met a few shifters, centuries ago. Your scents are the same. Lysandra sniffed at herself, but Adian murmured, So that's what it is! Lysandra looked at Aelin again. Say something. Aelin held up a hand. Just, just give me a moment. A moment to sort out one friend from another. The friend she had loved and who had lied to her at every chance. The friend she had hated and who she had kept secrets from herself. Hated until love and hate had met in the middle, fused by loss. Adian asked, How old were you when you found out? Young, five or six. I knew even then to hide it from everyone. It wasn't my mother, so my father must have had the gift. She never mentioned him, or seemed to miss him. Gift. Interesting choice of words, Rowan said. What happened to her? Lysandra shrugged. 
I don't know. I was seven when she beat me, then threw me out of the house. Because we lived here, in this city. And that morning, for the first time, I'd made the mistake of shifting in her presence. I don't remember why, but I remember being startled enough that I changed into a hissing tabby right in front of her. Shit, Adian said. So you're a full-powered shifter, Rowan said. I'd known what I was for a long time. From even before that moment, I knew that I could change into any creature. But magic was outlawed here, and everyone in every kingdom was distrustful of shapeshifters. How could they not be? A low laugh. After she kicked me out, I was left on the streets. We were poor enough that it was hardly different. But I spent the first two days crying on the doorstep. She threatened to turn me into the authorities, so I ran and I never saw her again. I even went back to the house months later, but she was gone. Moved away. She sounds like a wonderful person, Adian said. Lysandra hadn't lied to her. Nehemia had lied outright, kept things that were vital. But Lysandra was... They were even. After all, she hadn't told Lysandra she was queen. How'd you survive? Aelin asked at last, her shoulders relaxing. A seven-year-old on the streets of Rifthold doesn't often meet a happy end. Something sparked in Lysandra's eyes, and Aelin wondered if she had been waiting for the blow to fall, waiting for the order to get out. I used my abilities. Sometimes I was human. Sometimes I wore the skins of other street children with high standings in their packs. Sometimes I became an alley cat or a rat or a gull. And then I learned that if I made myself prettier, if I made myself beautiful, when I begged for money, it came far faster. I was wearing one of those beautiful faces the day magic fell, and I've been stuck in it ever since. So this face, Aelin said, isn't your real face? Your real body? No, and what kills me is that I can't remember what my real face was. That was the danger of shifting, that you would forget your real form, because it's the memory of it that guides the shifting. I remember being plain as a dormouse, but I don't remember if my eyes were blue or gray or green. I can't remember the shape of my nose or my chin. And it was a child's body, too. I don't know what I would look like now, as a woman. Aelin said. And this was the form that Arobin spotted you in a few years later? Lysandra nodded and picked at an invisible fleck of lint on her dress. If magic is free again, would you be wary of a shapeshifter? So carefully phrased, so casually asked, as if it weren't the most important question of all. Aelin shrugged and gave her the truth. I'd be jealous of a shapeshifter. Shifting into any form I please would come in rather handy, she considered it. A shapeshifter would make a powerful ally and an even more entertaining friend. Adian mused. It would make a difference on a battlefield once magic is freed. Rowan just asked. Did you have a favorite form? Lysandra's grin was nothing short of wicked. I liked anything with claws and big big fangs. Aelin swallowed her laugh. Is there a reason behind this visit, Lysandra? Or are you here just to make my friends squirm? All amusement faded as Lysandra held up a velvet sack that sagged with what looked like to be a large box. What you requested. The box thumped as she set the sack onto the worn wooden table. Aelin slid the sack toward herself, even as the males raised their brows and subtly sniffed at the box within. Thank you. Lysandra said, Arabin is going to call in your favor tomorrow, to be delivered the following night. Be ready. Good. It was an effort to keep her face blank. Adian leaned forward, glancing between them. Does he expect only Aelin to deliver it? No, all of you, I think. Rowan said, is it a trap? Probably in some way or another, Lysandra said. He wants you to deliver it and then join him for dinner. Demons and dining, Aelin said. A delightful combination. Only Lysandra smiled. Will he poison us? Adian asked. Aelin scratched at a piece of dirt on the table. Poison is an Arab in style. If he were to do anything to the food, it would be to add some drug that would incapacitate us while he had us moved wherever he wanted. It's the control that he loves, she added. Still staring at the table, not quite feeling like seeing what was written on Rowan's or Adian's face. The pain and fear, yes, but the power is what he truly thrives on. Lysandra's face had lost its softness, her eyes cold and sharp, a reflection of Aelin's own, no doubt. 
the only person who could understand, who had also learned firsthand exactly how far that lust for control went. Aelin rose from her seat. I'll walk you to your carriage. She and Lysandra paused among the stacks of crates in the warehouse. Are you ready? Lysandra asked, crossing her arms. Aelin nodded. I'm not sure the debt could ever be paid for what he, what they all did, but it will have to be enough. I'm running out of time. Lysandra pursed her lips. I won't be able to risk coming here again until afterward. Thank you. For everything. He could still have a few tricks up his sleeve. Be on your guard. And you be on yours. You're not mad I didn't tell you? Your secret could get you killed just as easily as mine, Lysandra. I just felt... I don't know. If anything, I wondered if I'd done something wrong. Something to make you not trust me enough to tell me. I wanted to. I've been dying to. Aelin believed her. You risked those vol guards for me. For Adian that day we rescued him. Aelin said. They'd probably be beside themselves if they learned there was a shifter in this city. And that night, at the pits, when she'd kept turning away from the vol and hiding behind Arabin, it had been a to avoid their notice. You have to be insane. Even before I knew who you were, Aelin, I knew that what you were working toward, it was worth it. Was it? Her throat tightened. A world where people like me don't have to hide. Lysandra turned away, but Aelin grabbed her by the hand. Lysandra smiled a bit. Times like these? I wish I had your particular skill set instead. Would you do it if you could? About two nights from now, I mean. Lysandra gently let go of her hand. I've thought about it every single day since Wesley died. I would do it, and gladly. But I don't mind if you do it. You won't hesitate. I find that comforting somehow. The invitation arrived by street urchin at 10 o'clock the next morning. Aelin stared at the cream-colored envelope on the table, before the fireplace, its red wax seal imprinted with crossed daggers. Adian and Rowan, peering over her shoulders, studied the box it had come with. Both in the males sniffed and frowned. It smells like almonds, Adian said. She pulled out the card. A formal invitation for dinner tomorrow at eight, for her and two guests, and a request for the favor owed to him. His patience was at an end, but in typical Arabin fashion, dumping the deepen at his doorstep wouldn't be enough. No, she'd deliver it on his terms. The dinner was late enough in the day to give her time to stew. There was a note at the end of the invitation in an elegant yet efficient scrawl. A gift, and one I hope you'll wear tomorrow night. She chucked the card onto the table and waved a hand at to Adian or Rowan to open the box as she walked to the window and looked out toward the castle. It was blindingly bright in the morning sun, glimmering as though it had been crafted from pearl and gold and silver. The slither of ribbon, the thud of a box lid opening, and... What the hell is that? She glanced over her shoulder. Adian held a large glass bottle in his hands, full of amber liquid. She said flatly, Perfumed skin oil. Why does he want you to wear it? Adian asked too quietly. She looked out the window again. Rowan stalked over and perched on the armchair behind her. A steady force at her back. Aelin said, it's just another move in the game we've been playing. She'd have to rub it into her skin. His scent. She told herself that she'd expect nothing less, but... And you're going to use it? Adian spat. Tomorrow, our one goal is to get the Amulet of Orinth from him. Agreeing to wear that oil will put him on unsure footing. I don't follow. The invitation is a threat, Rowan replied for her. She could feel him inches away, was aware of his movements as much as her own. Two companions, he knows how many of us are here. Knows who you are. And you? Adian asked. The fabric of his shirt sighed against Rowan's skin as he shrugged. He's probably figured out by now that I'm Fay. The thought of Rowan facing Arobin, and what Arobin might try to do. And what about the demon? Adian demanded. He expects us to just bring it over in all our finery? Another test. And yes. So when do we go catch ourselves a Vol commander? Aelin and Rowan glanced at each other. You're staying here, she said to Adian. Like hell I am. She pointed to his side. 
If you hadn't been a hot-headed pain in my ass and torn your stitches when you sparred with Rowan, you could have come. But you're still on the mend, and I'm not going to risk exposing your wounds to the filth in the sewers, just so you can feel better about yourself. Adian's nostrils flared as he reined in his temper. You're going to face a demon. She'll be taken care of, Rowan said. I can take care of myself, she snapped. I'm going to get dressed. She grabbed her suit from where she'd left it drying over an armchair before the open windows. Adian sighed behind her. Please, just be safe. And Lysandra is to be trusted? We'll find out tomorrow, she said. She trusted Lysandra. She wouldn't have let her near Adian otherwise. But Lysandra wouldn't necessarily know if Arabin was using her. Rowan lifted his brows. Are you all right? She nodded. I just want to get through these two days and be done with it. That will never stop being strange, Adian muttered. Deal with it, she told him, carrying the suit into the bedroom. Let's go hunt ourselves a pretty little demon. And that was chapter 38. I don't know if we're going to go a full two hours tonight, considering that dinner just got finished. But we'll do a couple more chapters and see what time it is. <sighs> Chapter 39. Dead as dead can be. Aelin said, towing the upper half of the word hound's remains. Rowan, crouching over one of the bottom bits, growled his confirmation. Lorcan doesn't pull punches, does he? She said, studying the reeking, blood-splattered sewer crossroads. There was hardly anything left of the Vol captains, or the word hound. In the matter of moments, Lorcan had massacred them all as if they were chattel. Gods above. Lorcan probably spent the entire fight imagining each of these creatures was you. Rowan said, rising from his crouch bearing a clawed arm. The stone skin seems like armor, but inside it's just flesh. He sniffed at it and snarled in disgust. Good, and thank you, Lorcan, for finding that out for us. She strode to Rowan, taking the heavy arm from him and waved at the prince with the creature's stiff fingers. Stop that, he hissed. She wriggled the demon's fingers a bit more. It'd make a good back scratcher. Rowan only frowned. Killjoy, she said, and chucked the arm into, onto the torso of the word hound. It landed with a heavy thump and click of stone. So Lorcan can bring down a word hound? Rowan snorted at the name she'd coined. And once it's down, it seems like it stays down. Good to know. Rowan eyed her warily. This trap wasn't just to send Lorcan a message, was it? These things are the king's puppets, she said. So his Grand Imperial Majesty now has a read on Lorcan's face and smell, and I suspect he will not be very pleased to have a fey warrior in his city. Why, I'd bet that Lorcan is currently being pursued by se the seven other word hounds, who no doubt have a score to settle on behalf of their king and their fallen brother. Thank you. <laughs> Rowan shook his head. I don't know whether to throttle you or clap you on the back. I think there's a long line of people who feel the same way. She scanned the sewer-turned charnel house. I need Lorcan's eyes elsewhere tonight, and tomorrow, and I need to know whether these word hounds could be killed. Why? He saw too much. Slowly, she met his gaze. Because I'm going to use their beloved sewer entrance to get into the castle, and blow up the clock tower right from under them. Rowan let out a low, wicked chuckle. That's how you're going to free magic? Once Lorcan kills the last of the word hounds, you're going in? He really should have killed me, considering the world of trouble that's now hunting him through the city. Rowan bared his teeth in a feral smile. He had it coming. Cloaked, armed, and masked, Aelin leaned against the stone wall of the abandoned building, while Rowan circled the bound Vogue commander in the center of the room. You've signed your death warrant, you maggots, the thing inside the guard's body said. Aelin clicked her tongue. You must not be a very good demon to be captured so easily. It had been a joke, really. Aelin had picked the smallest patrol, led by the mildest of the commanders. She and Rowan had ambushed the patrol just before midnight in a quiet part of the city. 
She barely killed two guards before the rest were dead at Rowan's hands. And when the commander tried to run, the Fey warrior had caught him within heartbeats. Rendering him unconscious had been the work of a moment. The hardest part had been dragging his carcass across the slums, into the building, and down into the cellar, where they'd chained him to a chair. I'm not a demon, the man hissed, as if every word burned him. Aelin crossed her arms. Rowan, bearing both Goldrin and Damaris, circled the man, a hawk closing in on prey. Then what's the ring for? She said, a gasp of breath, human, labored. To enslave us, corrupt us. And? Come closer and I might tell you. His voice changed then, deeper and colder. What's your name? Rowan asked. Your human tongues cannot pronounce our names or our language, the demon said. She mimicked. Your human tongues cannot pronounce our names. I've heard that one before, unfortunately. Aelin let out a low laugh as the creature inside the man seethed. What is your name? Your real name? The man thrashed, a violent jerking motion that made Rowan step closer. She carefully monitored the battle between two beings inside that body. At last, it said, Stevan. Stevan, she said. The man's eyes were clear, fixed on her. Stevan, she said again, louder. Quiet, the demon snapped. Where are you from, Stevan? Enough of Melisande. Stevan, she repeated. It hadn't worked on the day of Adian's escape. It hadn't been enough then, but now? Do you have a family, Stevan? Dead, all of them. Just as you will be. He stiffened, slumped, stiffened, slumped. Can you take off the ring? Never, the thing said. Can you come back, Stevan, if the ring is gone? A shudder that left his head hanging between his shoulders. I don't want to, even if I could. Why? The things, the things I did, we did. He liked to watch while I took them, while I ripped them apart. Rowan stopped his circling, standing beside her. Despite his mask, she could almost see the look on his face, the disgust and pity. Tell me about the Vogue princes, Aelin said. Both man and demon were silent. Tell me about the Vogue princes, she ordered. They are darkness, they are glory, they are eternal. Stevan, tell me, is there one here in Rifthold? Yes. Whose body is it inhabiting? The crown princes. Is the prince in there, as you are in there? I never saw him, never spoke to him, if, if it's a prince inside him. I can't hold out, can't stand this thing, if it's a prince. The prince will have broken him, used and taken him. Dorian. Dorian, the man breathed, please, his voice so empty and soft compared to that of the thing inside him. Please, just end it. I can't hold it. Liar, she purred. You gave yourself to it. No choice, the man gasped out. They came to our homes, our families. They said the rings were part of the uniform, so we had to wear them. A shudder went through him, and something ancient and cold smiled at her. What are you, woman? It licked its lips. Let me taste you. Tell me what you are. Aelin studied the black ring on its finger. Cain, once upon a time, months and lifetimes ago, Cain had fought the thing inside him. There had been a day in the halls of the castle when he looked hounded, hunted, as if despite the ring. I am death, she said simply, should you want it. The man sagged, the demon vanishing. Yes. He sighed. Yes. What would you offer me in exchange? Anything, the man breathed. Please. She looked at his hand, at his ring, and reached into her pocket. Then listen carefully. Aelin awoke, drenched in sweat and twisted in the sheets, fear clenching her like a fist. She willed herself to breathe, to blink, to look at the moon-bathed room, to turn her head to see the fey prince slumbering across the bed. Alive. Not tortured. Not dead. Still, she reached a hand out over the sea of blankets between them and touched his bare shoulder. Rock-hard muscle encased in velvet-soft skin. Real. 
They'd done what they needed to, and the Vol Commander was locked in another building, ready and waiting for tomorrow night, when they would bring him to the keep, Erebin's favor at last fulfilled. But the words of the demon rang through her head, and they had and then they blended with the voice of the Vogue Prince that had used Dorian's mouth like a puppet. I will destroy everything that you love. A promise. Aelin loosed a breath, careful not to disturb the Fey Prince sleeping beside her. For a moment, it was hard to pull back the hand touching his arm. For a moment, she was tempted to stroke her fingers down the curve of muscle. But she had one last thing to do tonight. So she withdrew her hand. And this time, he didn't wake when she crept out of the room. It was almost four in the morning when she slipped back into the bedroom, her boots clutched in one hand. She made it all of two steps, two immensely heavy, exhausted steps, before Rowan said from the bed, You smell like ash. She just kept going until she dropped her boots off in the closet, stripped down into her first shirt she could into the first shirt she could find, and washed her face and neck. I had things to do, she said as she climbed into bed. You were stealthier this time. The rage sabering off him was almost hot enough to burn through the blankets. This wasn't particularly high risk. Lie, 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 lie. She's just been lucky. And I suppose you're not going to tell me until you want to? She slumped against the pillows. Don't get pissy because I outstealthed you. His snarl reverberated across the mattress. It's not a joke. She closed her eyes, her limbs let in. I know. Aelin. She was already asleep. Rowan wasn't pissy. No, pissy didn't cover a fraction of it. The rage was still riding him the next morning, when he awoke before she did and slipped to her closet to examine the clothes she'd chucked off. Dust and metal and smoke and sweat tickled his nose. And there were streaks of dirt and ash on the black cloth. Only a few daggers lay scattered nearby, no sign of Goldrin or Demars having having been moved from where he dumped them on the closet floor last night. No whiff of Lorcan or the Vog, no scent of blood. Either she hadn't wanted to risk losing the ancient blades in a fight, or she hadn't wanted the extra weight. She was sprawled across the bed when he emerged, his jaw clenched. He, she hadn't even bothered to wear one of those ridiculous nightgowns. She must have been exhausted enough not to bother with anything other than that oversized shirt. His shirt, he noticed with no small amount of male satisfaction. It was enormous on her. It was so easy to forget how much smaller she was than him. How mortal. And how utterly unaware of the count control he had to exercise every day, every hour, to keep her at arm's length. To keep from touching her. He glowered at her before striding out of the bedroom. In the mountains, he would have made her go on a run, or chop wood for hours, or pull extra kitchen duty. This apartment was too small. Two full of males used to getting their own way, and a queen used to getting hers. Worse, a queen hell-bent hell -bent on keeping secrets. He'd dealt with young rulers before. Maeve had dispatched him to enough foreign courts that he knew how to get them to be healed. But Aelin? She'd taken him out to hunt demons. And yet this task, whatever she had done, required him to be kept in ignorance. Rowan filled the kettle, focusing on each movement, if only to keep from throwing it out the window. Making breakfast? How domestic of you. Aelin leaned against the doorway, irreverent as always. Shouldn't you be sleeping like the dead considering your busy night? Can we not get into a fight about it before my first cup of tea? With lethal calm, he set the kettle on the stove. After tea, then? She crossed her arms, sunlight kissing the shoulder of her pale blue robe. Such a creature of luxury, his queen. And yet, yet she hadn't bought a single new thing for herself lately. She loosed a breath and her shoulders slumped a bit. The rage roaring through his veins stumbled, and stumbled again when she chewed on her lip. I need you to come with me today. Anywhere you need to go, he said. She looked toward the table at the stove. To Erebin? He hadn't forgotten for one second where they were going to where they would be going tonight. That what she would be facing. She shook her head, then shrugged. No, I mean yes, I want you to come tonight, but there's something else I need to do, and I want to do today, before everything happens. He waited, restraining himself from going to her, from asking her to tell him more. That had been their promise to each other, space to sort out their own miserable lives, to sort out how to share them. He didn't mind. 
most of the time. She rubbed at her brows with her thumb and forefinger, and when she squared her shoulders, those silk-clad shoulders that bore a weight he'd do anything to relieve, she lifted her chin. There's a grave I need to visit. She didn't have a black gown fit for mourning, but Aelin figured Sam would have preferred to see her in something bright and lovely anyway. So she wore a tunic the color of spring grass, its sleeves capped with dusty gold and velvet cuffs. Life she thought, as she strode through the small, pretty graveyard overlooking the Avery. The clothes Sam would have wanted her to wear reminded her of life. The graveyard was empty, but the headstones and grass were well kept, and the towering oaks were budding with new leaves. A breeze coming in off the glimmering river set them sighing and ruffled her unbound hair, which was back now to its normal honey gold. Rowan had stayed near the little iron gate, leaning against one of those oaks to keep passers-by on the quiet city street behind them from noticing him. If they did, his black clothes and weapons painted him as a mere bodyguard. She had planned to come alone, but this morning she'd awoken and just needed him with her. The new grass cushioned each step between the pale headstones bathed in the sunlight streaming down. She picked up pebbles along the way, discarding the misshapen and rough ones, keeping those that gleamed with bits of quartz or color. She clutched a fistful of them by the time she approached the last line of graves at the edge of the large, muddy river flowing lazily past. It was a gr lovely grave, simple, clean, and on the stone was written, Sam Cortland, beloved. Arabin had left it blank, unmarked. But Wesley had explained in his letter how he'd asked the tombstone carver to come. She approached the grave, reading it over and over. Beloved, not just by her, but by many. Sam. Her Sam. For a moment, she stared at that stretch of grass, at the white stone. For a moment, she could see that beautiful face grinning at her, yelling at her, loving her. She opened her fist of pebbles and picked out the three loveliest. Two for the years since he'd been taken from her, one for what they'd been together. Carefully, she placed them at the apex of the headstone's curve. Then, she sat down against the stone, tucking her feet beneath her, and rested her head against the smooth, cool rock. Hello, Sam, she breathed onto the river breeze. She said nothing for a time, content to be near him, even in this form. The sun warmed her hair, a kiss of heat along her scalp, a trace of malo, perhaps, even here. She began talking, quietly, and succinct, succ succinctly, telling Sam about what had happened to her ten years ago, telling him about these past nine months. When she was done, she stared up at the oak leaves rustling overhead and dragged her fingers through the soft grass. I miss you, she said. Every day I miss you, and I wonder what you would have made of all this, made of me. I think, I think you would have been a wonderful king. I think they would have liked you more than me, actually. Her throat tightened. I never told you how I felt, but I loved you, and I think a part of me might always love you. Maybe you were my mate and I never knew it. Maybe I'll spend the rest of my life wondering about that. Maybe I'll see you again in the afterworld and then I'll know for sure. But until then, until then I'll miss you, and I'll wish you were here. She would not apologize, nor say it was her fault. Because his death wasn't her fault. And tonight, tonight she would settle that debt. She wiped at her face with the back of her sleeve and got to her feet. The sun dried her tears. She smelled the pine and snow before she heard him. And when she turned, Rowan stood a few feet away, staring at the headstone behind her. He was, I know who he was to you, Rowan said softly and held out his hand, not to take hers, but for a stone. She opened her fist and he sorted through the pebbles until he found one, smooth and round, the size of a hummingbird's egg. With a gentleness that cracked her heart, he set it on the headstone beside her own pebbles. You're going to kill Arabin tonight, aren't you? He said. After the dinner, when he's gone to bed, I'm going back to the keep and ending it. She'd come here to remind herself, remind herself why that grave before them existed and why she had those scars on her back. And the Amulet of Orin? An endgame, but also a distraction. The sunlight danced on the Avery, nearly blinding. You ready to do it? 
She looked back at the gravestone and at the grass concealing the coffin beneath. I have no choice but to be ready. And that was chapter 39. Um, chapter 40 isn't too long. We can do chapter 40 and then I'll stop and, uh, end for the night so that I can eat my dinner sitting beside me that is swiftly growing cold. <laughs> but I want to make sure I get enough read again tonight. Okay. Chapter 40. <clears throat> Elite spent two days on voluntary kitchen duty, learning where and when the laundresses ate and who brought their food. By that point, the head cook trusted her enough that when she volunteered to bring the bread up to the dining hall, he didn't think twice. No one noticed when she sprinkled the poison onto a few rolls of bread. The wing leader had sworn it wouldn't kill, just make the laundress sick for a few days. And maybe it made her selfish for placing her own survival first, but Elite didn't hesitate as she dumped the pale powder onto some of the rolls, blending it into the flour that dusted them. Elite marked one roll in particular to make sure she gave it to the laundress she'd noted days before, but the others would be given out at random to the other laundresses. Hell, she was likely going to burn in Hellas's realm forever for this. But she could think about her damnation when she had escaped and had was far, far away beyond the southern continent. Elide limped into the raucous dining hall, a quiet cripple with yet another platter of food. She made her way down the long table, trying to keep the weight off her leg as she leaned in again and again to deposit rolls onto plates. The laundress didn't even bother to thank her. The next day, the keep was abuzz with the news that a third of the laundresses were sick. It must have been the chicken at dinner, they said, or the mutton, or the soup, since only some of them had it, had had it. The cook apologized, and Elite had tried not to apologize to him when she saw the terror in his eyes. The head laundress actually looked, re looked relieved when Elite limped in and volunteered to help. She told her to pick any station and get to work. Perfect. But guilt pushed down on her shoulders as she went right to that woman's station. She worked all day and waited for the bloodied clothes to arrive. When they finally did, there was not as much blood as before, but more of a substance that looked like vomit. Elite almost vomited herself as she washed them all, and wrung them out, and dried them, and pressed them. It took hours. Night was falling when she folded the last of them, trying to keep her fingers from shaking. But she went up to the head laundress and said softly, no more than a nervous girl, Should, should I bring them back? The woman smirked. Elite wondered if the other laundress had been sent down there as a punishment. There's a stairwell over that way that will take you to the subterranean levels. Tell the guards your Misty's replacement. Bring the clothes to the second door on the left and drop them outside. The woman looked at Elite's chains. Try to run if you can. Elite's bowels had turned to water by the time she reached the guards, but they didn't so much as question her as she recited what the head laundress had said. Down, 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 she walked into the gloom of the spiral stairwell. The temperature plummeted the farther she descended. And then she heard the moaning. Moans of pain, of terror, of despair. She held the basket of clothes to her chest. A torch flickered ahead. Gods, it was so cold here. The stairs widened toward the bottom, flaring out into a straight descent and revealing a broad hallway, lit with torches and lined with countless iron doors. The moans were coming from behind them. Second door on the left. It was gouged with what looked like claw marks pushing out from within. There were guards down here. Guards and strange men, patrolling up and down, opening and closing the doors. Elite's knees wobbled. No one stopped her. She set the basket of laundry in front of the second door and rapped quietly. The iron was so cold that it burned. Clean clothes, she said against the metal. It was absurd. In this place, with these people, they still insisted on clean clothes. Three of the guards had paused to watch. She pretended not to notice, pretended to back away slowly, a scared little rabbit, pretended to catch her mangled foot on something, and slip. But it was real pain that roared through her leg as she went down, her chain snapping and tugging at her. The floor was as cold as the iron door. None of the guards made to help her up. She hissed, clutching her ankle, buying as much time as she could, her heart thundering, thundering, thundering. And then the door cracked open. 
Manon watched Alid vomit again and again. A black-beaked sentinel had found her curled in a ball in a corner of a random hallway, shaking a puddle of piss beneath her. Having heard that the servant was now Manon's property, the sentinel had dragged her up here. Astern and Sorrel stone stood stone-faced behind Manon as the girl puked into the bucket again, only bile and spittle this time, and at last raised her head. Report, Manon said. I saw the chamber, Alid rasped. They all went still. Something opened the door to take the laundry, and I saw the chamber beyond. With those keen eyes of her, she'd likely seen too much. Out with it, Manon said, leaning against the bedpost. Astron and Sorrel lingered by the door, monitoring for eavesdroppers. Alid stayed on the floor, her legs twisted out to the side. But the eyes that met Manon sparked with a fiery temper that the girl rarely revealed. That thing that opened the door was a beautiful man. A man with golden hair and a collar around his neck. But he was not a man. There was nothing human in his eyes. One of the princes, it had to be. I, I pretended to fall so I could buy myself more time to see who opened the door. When he saw me on the ground, he smiled at me. And this darkness leaked out of him. She lurched toward the bucket and leaned over it, but didn't vomit. After another moment, she said, I managed to look past him into the room behind. She stared at Manon, then at Ashen and Sorrel. You said they were to be implanted? Yes, Manon said. Did you know how many times? What? Asterin breathed. Did you know? Elid said, her voice uneven with rage or fear, how many times they were each to be implanted with offspring before they were let go? Everything went quiet in Manon's head. Go on. Elid's face was white as death, making her freckles look like dried, splattered blood. From what I saw, they've delivered at least one baby each and are about, already about to give birth to another. That's impossible, Sorrel said. The witchlings? Asterin breathed. Alid really did vomit again this time. When she was done, Manon mastered herself enough to say, Tell me about the witchlings. They are not witchlings. They are not babies. Alid spat, covering her face with her hands as if to rip out her eyes. They are creatures. They are demons. Their skin is black, is like black diamond. And they, they have these snouts with teeth fangs already they have fangs and not like yours she lowered her hands they have teeth of black stone there is nothing of you in them if sorrel and astrin were horrified they showed nothing what of the yellow legs manon demanded they have them chained to tables altars and they were sobbing they were begging the man to let them go but they're they're so close to giving birth and then I ran. I ran from there as fast as I could in. Oh, gods. Oh, gods. Alid began weeping again. Slowly, slowly Manon turned to her second and third. Sorrel was pale, her eyes raging. But Astrin met Manon's gaze, met it with a fury that Manon had never seen directed at her. You let them do this. Manon's nails flicked out. These are my orders. This is our task. This is an abomination. Asterin shouted. Alid paused her weeping and backed away to the safety of the fireplace. And then there were tears, tears in Asterin's eyes. Manon snarled. Has your heart softened? The voice might as well have been her grandmother's. Do you have no stomach for? You let them do this! Asterin bellowed. Sorrel got right into Asterin's face. Stand down! Astrin shoved Sorrel away so violently that Manon's second went crashing into the dresser. Before Sorrel could recover, Astrin was inches from Manon. You gave him those witches. You gave him witches. Manon lashed out, her hand wrapping around Astrin's throat, but Astrin gripped her arm, digging in her iron nail so hard that blood ran. For a moment, Manon's blood dripping on the floor was the only sound. Astrin's life should have been forfeited for drawing blood from the air. Light glinted off Sorrel's dagger as she approached, ready to tear it into to tear it into Astrin's spine if Manon gave the order. Manon could have sworn Sorrel's hand wobbled slightly. Manon met Astrin's gold-flecked black eyes. 
You do not question. You do not demand. You are no longer third. Vesta will replace you. You? A harsh, broken laugh. You're not going to do anything about it, are you? You're not going to free them. You're not going to fight for them. For us? Because what would grandmother say? Why hasn't she answered your letters, Manon? How many have you sent now? Astrin's iron nails dug in harder, shredding flesh. Manon embraced the pain. Tomorrow morning at breakfast, you will receive your punishment. Manon hissed and shoved her third away, sending Astrin staggering toward the door. Manon let her bloodied arm hang at her side. She'd need to bind it up soon. The blood on her palm, on her fingers, felt so familiar. If you try to free them, if you do anything stupid, Astrin Blackbeak, Manon went on, the next punishment you'll receive will be your own execution. Astrin let out another joyless laugh. You would not have disobeyed even if it had been Blackbeaks down there, would you? Loyalty, obedience, brutality, that is what you are. Leave while you can still walk, Sorrel said softly. Astrin whirled toward the second and something like hurt flashed across her face. Manon blinked. Those feelings. Astrin turned on her heel and left, slamming the door behind her. Alid had managed to clear her head by the time she offered to clean and bandage Manon's arm. What she'd seen today, both in this room and in that chamber below. You let them do this. She didn't blame Astrin for it, even if it had shocked her to see the witch lose control compl so completely. She had never seen any of them react with anything but cool amusement, indifference, or raging bloodlust. Manon hadn't said a word since she'd ordered Sorrel away, to follow Astrin and keep her from doing something profoundly stupid. As if saving those yellow legs witches might be foolish. As if that sort of mercy was reckless. Manon was staring at nothing as Alid finished applying the salve and reached for the bandages. The puncture wounds were deep, but not bad enough to warrant stitches. Is your broken kingdom worth it? Alid dared to ask, though his burnt gold eyes shifted toward the darkened window. I do not expect a human to understand what it is like to be an immortal with no homeland, to be cursed with eternal exile. Cold, distant words. Alid said, My kingdom was conquered by the king of Adarlan, and everyone I loved was executed. My father's lands and my title were stolen from me by my uncle, and my best chance of safety now lies in sailing to the other end of the world. I understand what it is like to wish, to hope. It is not hope, it is survival. Lee gently rolled a bandage around the witch's forearm. It is hope for your homeland that guides you, that makes you obey. And what of your future? For all your talk of hope, you seem resigned to fleeing. Why not return to your kingdom, to fight? Perhaps the horror she'd witnessed today only gave her the courage to say, Ten years ago, my parents were murdered. My father was executed on a butchering block in front of thousands. But my mother? My mother died defending Aelin Galathinius, the heir to the throne of Terrasin. She bought Aelin time to run. They followed Aelin's tracks to the frozen river, where they said she must have fallen in and drowned. But you see, Aelin had fire magic. She could have survived the cold. And Aelin? Aelin never really liked me or played with me because I was so shy, but I never believed them when they said she was dead. Every day since then, I've told myself that she got away and that she's still out there, biding her time, growing up, growing strong, so that she might one day come to save Terrison. And you are my enemy, because if she returns, she will fight you. But for ten years, until I came here, I endured Vernon because of her. Because of the hope that she got away, and my mother's sacrifice wasn't in vain. I thought that one day, Aelin would come to save me, would remember I existed and rescue me from that tower. There it was, her greatest secret, which she had never dared tell anyone, even her nursemaid. Even though, even though she never came, even though I am here now, I can't let go of that. And I think that is why you obey, because you have been hoping every day of your miserable, hideous life that you'll get to go home. Alid finished wrapping the bandage and stepped back. Manan was staring at her now. If this Aelin Galathinius was indeed, were indeed alive, would you try to run to her? Fight with her? I would fight with tooth and claw to get to her. But there are lines I would not cross, because I don't think I could face her if, if I couldn't face myself for what I'd done. Manan said nothing. 
Alide stepped away, heading to the bathing room to wash her hands. The wing leader said from behind her, Do you believe monsters are born or made? From what she'd seen today, she would say some creatures were very much born evil. But when Manon was asking, I'm not the one who needs to answer that question, Alid said. And that was chapter 40, and where we are going to wrap it up for tonight so that I can eat this lovely dinner sitting beside me. Oh, I forgot to put a bookmark in. Whoops. Hold on. There we go. Ooh, I also adore the Manon chapters.